Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Wow, what a huge turnout. This is a um, pretty awe-inspiring way to um, kick off your series. I hope I do you justice. Uh, if you want to fall asleep, do. I think it's completely fine. I go to the opera. I think if you fall asleep, it's the opera's fault. It's not my fault. So it's my fault if you go to sleep. I'm not going to do what Zaha does, and she did, rather. She used to stop and sort of point you out and say, wake up, wake up. So uh, I'm not like that. Anyway, I'm going to just take you through a roller coaster of projects very quickly. Happy to talk about them afterwards, uh, and they're obviously on the website, etc. Uh, so I called it What Next for the City because uh, I always seem to be interested in architecture just beyond bricks and mortar. Uh, uh, and we're called DSTHA, and this is where we are. We are down a dark alley in Vauxhall, and next to a pub. And sometimes if there's a delivery, you have to go through the pub to get to our studio. We like that. And we use this as a way of interviewing our clients and also people who come to work for us. If they don't like being next to a pub beside a church in dirty old Vauxhall, you know, it's kind of self-selecting. So we're very aware that we don't try to just be like every other architect uh, because we don't really mind what other people do. We think about what we're doing. So we're very conscious of our practice. And this is our lovely um, yard. So number one priority when we got this studio was to have outdoor space. That's our temporary, temporary for planning permission shed, uh, which is our model shop where we make models and we also use the yard uh, to experiment. But most of all, we're very sociable. We have lunch together every week, um, and it's just really important to have the outdoors as part of our lives. And that is um, partly because <clears throat> what's always interested us is that new behaviours uh, demand new models of practice. So we are all using space differently, and it doesn't take us much to think about, you know, up until uh, two or three years ago, we were kind of all globally connected in the same space through various kind of globalised uh, corporations and sort of means of communication. But obviously something came along and sort of disrupted that. And, and that really has had an impact on everything you're doing and everything we're doing. And thank God it arrived in time to kick some ass, hopefully not too late. Um, what was interesting was this sort of sudden discovery of this thing called space between us. Um, and you can apply a posh word to that, proxemics, if any of you want to look at it for a dissertation. Proxemics is the distance between people and the way that you feel comfortable with each other. And that's been something that we've always been interested in, the kind of minutiae of how people come together and the big scale of cities. So here's a bit of lovely petroleum fueled architecture for you. Um, don't really want to make that kind of thing. Uh, but obviously we know streets took on a different meaning during the pandemic um, and also the consciousness of who was in the streets. And then we also started thinking about are we even going to have any bloody st streets by the end of it? Because uh, I remember the first, uh, first question I asked clients was, is your site going to flood? And they used to look at me like I was crazy, but thankfully now they're taking notice. Uh, so it is, as a practice, we know that we all live in one environment, one world, and we have to talk about that in everything that we do. And that means that, as a practice, we are transdisciplinary. So we don't just silo ourselves as architects or landscape architects or urban designers or even have those dis different disciplines working in isolation in a practice. We all know a bit about everything, and if we don't, we know who to ask. Believe it or not, you probably do. This is not all that dissimilar to what I faced when I was your age going for my year out. Uh, this is obviously about 100 years before, but um, I, was, I, was, I was born into the world of uh, slide rules and uh, what were they called? Parallel motions. That's it. I'm looking at some colleagues who are remembering what that's like. You're now born into the age of this kind of thing. This was a sort of joke, uh, well, not a joke, it was a serious bit of research some students at the LSA did uh, seven years ago about what was the future of practice. And now, if, uh, hands up if you know anybody called Max Q. Well, I really strongly recommend you get Max Q to come here and do a talk about what they're doing. They're basically out using algorithms to take out all of what you guys do and want to do, which is to have a really human impact and cultural impact on the built environment. They will just put in the data and come out with an infinite number of uh, models, give them to the client, and then they use the architect to dress it up afterwards. So it's, you know, really hard times are about to hit and you're, 
let's all hope we're ready for it. Uh, the kind of engagement we like is using <coughs> new technology, but it's more likely to be uh, you know, engaging with young people in urban design exercises and changing their environments. So what's always in been interesting when I looked back on my practice is this correlation between thinking and doing, and you're probably well aware of it, that you have active subjects where you're designing and then you have more reflective ones. Uh, and it's always been a kind of interest between the, the sort of small projects that I was starting to do uh, just over 20 years ago when I set my practice up. Uh, Tony Fretton had been my former employer and he gave me a job and this is a house for a divorced couple. Sorry about the quality. Uh, that caused quite a storm, unbuilt, at, well it was just built, but un, unbuilt at the time, but really people were fascinated that an architect would go public about the fact that families split up and need accommodation. So there's always been this interest in trying to deal with what's really happening on the ground. And then also, while I was doing that, I was helping set up something you might be aware of called the Jane Drew Prize, which was to really ra ra sort of raise awareness of you know, the role of diversity in architecture, in particular women at the time. Um, so we carried on making uh, buildings in this kind of, wow, we've won a competition in, Ch in uh, Colchester and, oh, isn't that interesting? Whenever we do a public building, we do a route that you can see in and then out again. Why do you do that? Oh, I'm not really sure. Uh, started getting commissions in the centre of London. I don't know if you know this building next to Tower Bridge, a building right next to Norman Foster's More London development. That's Tower Bridge in the corner um, and that's Pottersfields Park. And it was, had been bombed during the war, my taxi driver told us, told me when I went there the first time. Those were the days when you used to get a taxi into the central London. Um, and I found out the whole area had been completely blasted. But of course, Norman's glassy, beautiful world didn't actually let you know that there had been damage. And so this is made out of burnt timber, and it was the first building in the UK to have burnt timber. Uh, we found out after we built it that you could buy it uh, on the internet in Japan, as you do. Uh, we started getting bigger and bigger projects like schools, numbers of schools. This is two schools in Surrey that were shortlisted for the Sterling Prize. And, and for some reason, we put a road in between the two of it because we realised the people in the distance had to trek through a school field to get to their shops and had cut through the fence to do that, that we wanted to empower them and kind of dignify the fact that there were things like desire lines in life and need. And why should a school that's closed so much of the time stop that? And then it all came together in 2013. Um, at the end of three years' study, I was asked to do a PhD. And I, I laughed when I was asked if I wanted to do a PhD because I'm a practicing architect. I get on with it. I teach as well. And this university in Australia with people I knew said, no, no, you are a venturous practice. I was like, uh-huh. Look up the word venturous. Not sure what that means. But they said, you seem to be doing something, you know, that we can't put a finger on it. So they spent, I spent two and a half years sort of trying to work out what we were doing and having like crits with outside other architects and ag academics saying, so why is it that you're interested in the city? Why do you always extend your buildings into gardens and landscape? You know, why are you always uh, sort of shouting about things and raising awareness about issues? Um, and I used to think it was attention seeking or just being bloody awkward. But actually, it is a strong passion, I can clearly say, smiling at my friend Alicia in the background, to democratise architecture. Really, you know, really want everybody to be involved with it. And I don't see why it has to be so siloed and isolated and many other things beside. Uh, so here are the little um, beautiful jewellery studio on the left, as you can see, next to the Shard. Actually took longer to build and get planning permission than the Shard. Can you believe it? And this is the little workshop on Tower Bridge Road. They're just a 20 minute, 15 minute walk uh, between each other. So please do go and have a look. They are really lovely. And uh, the jeweler wanted to be an architect. He's an architect monke, as they say. And he uh, worked with us intimately on these buildings. And we are unusual as a practice that we lose a lot of money doing small projects because we love small projects as well as big projects. They're really unprofitable which is hard to believe, but you know, if you want to make them beautiful, it does take a lot of effort. Uh, over time, we started working more in the centre of the city and got introduced to Derwent London through um, HMM, introduced us, and that they uh, gave us a commission, two commissions here. First of all, left um, is just around the corner from here, off Tottenham Court Road on Whitfield Street. This is for some affordable housing. 
that's been converted from an old warehouse. And um, I was teaching in Switzerland at the time, and you can see the Alps had clearly influenced me. I was trying to make a skyline because it was just a flat-roofed building and wanted to bring some joy for the residents every time they came home. And then this is Corner House. I don't know if you know it. It's been well, well used as a reference <laughs> on many a design and access statement by other architects. Uh, this was one of the, f the first uses of Peterson Bricks in central London, uh, Svedo and London. And uh, we got into trouble with the engineers because we said, um, you see that brick? Uh, we would like, uh, so almost quoting Khan, we'd like a brick to be a brick. And we would like the walls of this building to be load-bearing. You know, so like when you put a brick on top of a brick, it carries load. Well, he said, she said, so she said, no, brick, brickwork is cladding, Deborah. And I said, no, no, bricks are meant to be load-bearing. The whole of Fitzrovia is load-bearing. Uh, we would like ours to be an independent, self-supporting brick wall. And she said, no, no, you've got to pick it up, clip it onto the concrete frame like we always do, make it really skinny, and then send all the load into the building, down all those columns and slabs, into the ground, into piles. And I said, no, we're not doing it. And if you don't do me a load-bearing calculation by Monday, I'm telling the client that you're being unhelpful. She phoned me up on Monday morning, and this is when you have to show agency. You do not make yourself popular by pushing for things, particularly if you're from a minority. And um, she called in the, on the morning and uh, on Monday morning and said, "Oh my God, Deborah, we've reduced the amount of concrete. We don't need so many piles. The slabs are thinner. I've got rid of loads of columns." And it was a fantastic moment because she felt that she owned that, even though I'd had to sort of push her into it. She owned it. So I'm just hoping you all do the same and show a bit of oomph when you get that intransigent, do it just like everybody else has done attitude in the building industry. Um, this was our drawing for a place you might know just off Tottenham Court Road called Alfred Place near Store Street in the building centre. Go there now and there is a park um, and that's courtesy of the overall vision that we did for Camden back in 2014 to slow down and take out the traffic from Tottenham Court Road and Gower Street uh, and also to stop Shaftesbury Avenue early so that there was more public space. That was our, our vision that came on the back actually of those two projects. Camden said, we've noticed every time DSTHA do a project, you talk about the city, would you like to design a bit of city? So they had a competition and we won it. So that was amazing. So that set us off on this broader discipline, disciplinary practice. So as um, I was mentioned at the introduction, I helped set up the LSA straight on the back of that PhD saying, oh my God, the profession is just so stultified. We have got to change the way that practice and theory, practice and the acad academia work together. And so the LSA was born. And it's very much based in practice. So this is in our studio where we have a great big blackboard and we have groups from who work with us and come and study at the LSA. They go out into practices. So it's a different model, obviously, to this. But it's um, it really is about, it sort of has a philosophy that goes with it that is that, 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 that you have a duty to the city, as a, even as a student, to give back and... and contribute as much as possible. And then in the meantime, well, we've carried on growing, shrinking, growing, you know, fluctuating, depending on what's going on. But we've won, you know, lovely projects, like this is just a shadow study for a new building that we won in 2015, still not built on Piccadilly. So hopefully that will be the first, the go-ahead's just been given, the first woman, woman designed building on Piccadilly, which I've really got my fingers uh, crossed for uh, fingers yeah that's the word fingers crossed and this again has a load-bearing facade uh the crown estate were like what 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 pick it up clip it on took took the time but obviously charlie was listening and it's now got a load-bearing facade anyway um i'm just going to show you a very hopefully a video that is that playing yet yeah I'm going to show you two projects uh, that were mentioned beforehand. The first is the Tustin Estate in Southwark. This is the Old Kent Road. And <clears throat> this is the Tustin Estate, which is, a, is affordable housing. It was built in the 60s. It's got th three towers, a series of mid-rise blocks, and then some lower uh, sort of terraces that are just coming into view now. And it's within a stone's throw of ca uh, Canada Water, and also the centre of town, because it's really much closer. It's gone through lots of changes, and this actually repeats itself due to some glitch, so I can tell you what's happening uh, when it repeats itself. 
but it used to be open country, you know, country, countryside. Then it got built out with high density housing uh, and became factories and was uh, demolished in, to make way for the 1970s scheme. And really now, it, the project was about how to regenerate the area and link the individual, their home, and the wider estate. So this, we found the original model for the scheme and some wonderful photographs of uh, what a bank looked like in the late 60s. Um, and we got to know lots of uh, residents uh, to find out, you know, the sheer pride they had inside their homes was not what we found out on the street in terms of how the council had maintained it or how people felt they could behave. It was very, very, uh, you can see lots and lots of barriers and really speeded up movie here. But at the middle of it had this fantastic green space. But in order to, as you all know, the model goes, in, in order to build some, make improvements, you have to generate income because the, the government won't pay for it. So we had lots of engagement with the residents, uh, worked with Resolve Collective and uh, with a couple of other architects too. And through that process, we came up with densification, but took the residents on a really great route all the way through so that they had been to precedent, had seen buildings like it, other estates that had had this done, the pros and cons. But we looked at a phase development to take the school and the park at the centre and looked at options for degrees of densification and the kind of costs. It was the first time that uh, Southwark had used a real, uh, uh, had empowered the tenants on a tenant forum where they were taught about all the viability studies and the money and how it stacks up. So it's fantastic. Uh, and it's really, uh, at the first meeting with Southwark, we said, we're keeping the park. And they were like, oh, can't you put houses on that? And we're just like, no. So again, had to really hold our ground to make sure that we put sort of people and nature at the heart of a scheme, which usually are sort of plagued with difficulties and, and had amazing testimony from the local residents uh, as a result of that. So that's that scheme. I think it's just going to uh, finish up pretty swiftly just as you're walking through um, there you go so that was um, that's Shay and Seth uh, so Summers Town as well this was Camden coming back and saying could you put a team together to master plan the area in red here between Euston and St Pancras and King's Cross behind the crick a kind of scattering of buildings and leftover park space, which looked a bit like this and really wasn't very popular. The red zigzag areas where you felt unsafe. So we said, can we unite those green spaces to be one continuous experience? So this was kind of sketching early. We've got to make a green space lead and the architecture follow around. So we were appointed the master planners uh, with uh, a whole series of other architects. So we came up with a scheme of making one park and the schemes wrapping round, which are predominantly housing, provide fantastic overlooking, which wasn't there before. So I think it's starting down in the left, we have Adam Kahn uh, and uh, now it's Morrison Co with some housing, Nick Hayhurst with some, a school, more Morrison Co housing, and then DRMM doing a, a tower. And then we were combining all of that together with landscape and master planning principles. So we kind of dictated the palette, the kind of way in which you approach the buildings, the scale, the distribution of uses. And we did it all through workshops, as you saw in that image. And here it is being built out last year, which I think it might be the year before last, coming over the site. There's the school and now there's obviously King's Cross in the distance. And here just in front of us is where we're about to start on site with two more blocks of housing. And down on the right, uh, the tower was just about to start on site when that was taken. So we're gonna take you for a very uh, unstable journey up to the school first. And then I'm gonna take you around on my bike uh, through the sort of area near Adam, Nick and uh, Morrison Co's uh, building. So we're leaving the crick at the moment and we're just coming under a 26 storey tower, which is not something that we really wanted to put on the site, but again, no government funding. So we made the smallest, smallest possible footprint and in the area made the least impact on the views into the park. So these are our sketches from the master plan and landscape design that we did. Oop. Sorry, just bumping along on my bicycle here. Uh, obviously, we've got pr proximity of neighbours, but we're really trying to maximise these long, long views. So this is about to go on site, the landscape 
uh, in the foreground here that you can see a sort of at teenage play area. That's going on site shortly. Uh, and then the housing's happening at the beginning of next year. So we're looking back. This is all going to be open up, opened up with a play area for adults and children down by the creek because we, we've heard scientists like to get out of their labs. So we're trying to bring play into their lives. We've come to the other end of the site and on our left we're seeing Adam Kahn's housing with eight units and then his uh, wonderful Plot 10 community and play centre with a basketball court on the roof. Uh, this area will all be opened out with much more open places to run. Ooh, let me looking at the details there. Um, a legally parked car, we've got that under hand, under, under control now. Uh, and then looking towards the school. And then again, this area is going to be completely re-landscaped. Um, and this is a major route here, north-south, for cyclists uh, going from Camden down into the West End via the road, Osselton Street, next to the library and the Crick. So only a stone's throw from here. That's looking at that school entrance. And now I think we're going to come back. Oh, yeah, we're going to come back, actually, to begin with. Uh, this is where the old school used to go up to that footpath. So this was all enclosed with um, barriers. So we've made this large sort of green connection between the Purchase Street space in front of us and the, uh, pool, uh, the uh, Phoenix Road space behind us. Sorry if it's a bit giddy. And then this really is miraculous, this connection that we hope to get. It, it really does make it feel like one continuous space. And you can see the greenery behind inside the courtyard of the school. That was really important that all of these developments have courtyards and gardens as part of them because that's part of central of Summers Town language of all those housing blocks have gardens sort of glimpsed from uh, outside, but a wonderful verdant oasis within. And now we're going to go along. All these railings will be pulled down. And this will be the wonderful sort of positive frontage to make you feel more safe with that overlooking and a really nice green sort of forecourt to the housing on the left as well. So a real park for the whole of Summers Town. And then we're going to finally come up, I think. And I hope think I think we're going to finish now. Uh, Adam's a bit embarrassed about those downpipes. Uh, that was a change of heart by the client. Um, when you build projecting uh, balconies, you can't let water drop onto the public highway. So they had to put those dreadful things in. But this is the team. As you can see, it's really diverse, uh, even though this is only a few years ago. I am still trying. So come on, everybody, get into the profession and change it, because there's still too much of that. Lovely though they are, the... Um, Pale and male brigade are, are still there in force. Oh, well, I have to click to go forward. Great. Uh, how do I get this? Yeah. Uh, in the midst of making all of that, I've, I've helped edit uh, a journal. If you want to get academic, do look it up in your library. I'm sure the journal uh, is part of your leg regular library uh, sort of periodicals. This is a scholarly journal, apparently, uh, called AD, which is uh, cited for your universities to earn pipe points. <laughs> I did this, but I don't think anybody, earned, maybe the LSA earned some points, but uh, it is about the business of research. So it is about how do you take the stuff from inside the academy and or the thoughts that go along with practice and, and make them part of everyday business. Uh, and we were looking at how knowledge and learning are redefining the workplace and practice so that the boundaries have been blurred. Obviously, there's now the rise of the apprenticeships, the LSA, et cetera. But uh, big employers now have to pay to educate their staff in a way that didn't happen 20, 30 years ago anyway. So do, do enjoy that. Um, and I suppose what we've uncovered through this uh, research and most recently the work I've been doing at Yale with students is this idea post-pandemic of spatial justice and, and most importantly with my students with Alicia at the LSA a couple of years ago, uh, looking at spatial justice. And that is just about how can you have a more equitable system that lets everybody have an impact on the spaces around them 
and that their needs are recognised in those spaces. There's no more shut up and put up with it. It's, you know, we have the Equalities Act. We have, most importantly, we have climate crisis. We have rising cost of living. We have huge health inequality, as Summerstown will show you. And, you know, obviously there's an issue with social ju justice. So that's where our ongoing research lies. Uh, and that's why DSDHA uh, is this kind of transdisciplinary um, practice. And we call what we do on a larger scale spatial strategy because we find we can't just put things into a neat box of urban design, landscape, architecture, brief writing. We, we have a kind of a spatial, spatial, a spatial strat, spatially strategic point of view. And that is from a guy, I got that from a guy called Peter Buchanan, who said it's the one thing that architects have is incredible spatial skills and we have to use those in order to sort of help the planet. We're uniquely placed to help and it's underscored by research. So I'm going to whiz you through some built buildings. How long have I been going? Half an hour. How you ha how's the sleep brigade going? Not too bad. Not too bad. Right, so National Youth Theatre. Uh, Fantastic organisation. Hands up, does anybody know the NYT? Anybody heard of it? A couple, a few, oh yeah, a few. There's a, yeah, good, yeah. Um, a few people had heard of it, but I think many more now. Uh, it is the only sort of national institution that takes on board uh, the sort of performance and the role of uh, kind of theatre beyond it just being something you put on a stage. It's about the skills that you get. It's about the sense of self you get from it. And um, it's a hugely important part of our infrastructure, but is was until two years ago housed in this completely anonymous building on um, Holloway Road uh, behind some beautiful trees and with this grand staircase that if you were brave enough to try and enter, you got up there and, and it said entrance round the corner. It was completely inaccessible, very hostile, and this is a place where all those young people aged 11 to 21 were coming for, for their auditions, uh, you know, for a life-changing experience. Many of them, we found out afterwards, never, we found out people didn't take their auditions because they couldn't face going into that building because it was so off-putting on such a horrible road. Um, it really, when you're inside, it was a great atmosphere, but that atmosphere was just not visible. They were housed in this single floor, um, where, which was an old furniture warehouse. Uh, and the big space above, um, there's that side door, the big space above uh, the, that image is taken in, was on the whole, was unavailable to the students at the uh, NYT because apart from when they put on big productions, that was being hired out to generate income to the big West End theatres that need a big stage. This is the biggest rehearsal stage in London. So if you want to go and see Tina Turner, it was made here or Back to the Future. They, they all come here and do, it's, it's amazing if you're there when the stars are there. But quite a lot of the students didn't know who was in the building. Uh, yeah, there's that lovely entrance. That's from the early 90s, apparently. That's what they used to do in those days. Anyway, so the first thing we did, um, when we went for the interview, we didn't take any ideas. We just said, oh, we've had a look at you. Could, we, we understand that you are national. So you seem to go around the UK and do performances and have auditions. And oh, you go to Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia? <clears throat> Maybe not. Uh, we were quite provocative with them and said, you have got up your game, guys. You are a national institution and you're behaving in a really parochial way sort of self, in, in introverted fashion, shall we say. We then showed them this slide and said, um, we also think the welcome you give your students when they arrive is a slap in the face. They've all trekked from across Britain via these, let's say, uh, train stations. They go all the way up to horrible Holloway Road and walk either from Finsbury Park, Archway or Holloway Road. And, you know, then they get that awful building. You know, we should be thinking about this. And then in terms of networks, uh, where do you put your performances on? Because you called the National Theatre, but you haven't got a theatre in the building. <sighs> come again. They said, oh, what we do is we take the money from the West End that's come to rehearse here, and then we go and hire a space in the West End using that money. And we're like, what? Why do you, why do, you do that? And, and do you talk to the people who run the West End? Oh, not really. You know, well, they did a bit. 
but it was, it was all very sort of haphazard. And in fact, as you can see, NYT HQ, which is where all the decision makers were, was in a different building to where all the students were over in Holloway Road. So they were having a really groovy time down at Camden Market, thinking this is great, all staff. Students stranded with a couple of sort of caretakers up on Holloway Road. Um, and then we said, well, if you are uh, renting out your space, who are your competitors? And they're like, oh my God, this is like a, a test. These are the ones, you know, and that's how we discovered that they have a unique offering. They have the biggest stage. So we knew we're not going to touch that stage, you know, the big, the big rehearsal space. It's not a theatre, it's just a, a big room. Um, and we can, then we said, and what about where we are right now? What about all these educational facilities in London, the schools, the primary schools, the universities? What's your relationship? Because it's the National Youth Theatre, but you're really a learning institution. They're like, mm, cut it out, cut it out. And while you're at it, we said, what about near the site? What about the schools here? And they were like, uh, uh, yeah, we do a couple of um, workshops. There was very little going on as a kind of ecosystem. Um, and they were having a hard time surviving because of the funding. So they really did want to sort that out. But they knew they needed to reinvent themselves. And then we showed them this shocking... Uh, image which is Holloway Road and the sort of levels of pollution on those roads you know they really are they have a duty we think to their students and their staff to try and get their oar in and change it so we showed them these diagrams and said yeah this is what you're doing at the moment lots of money coming in for West End then you pay for it think again why don't you set up some partnerships and the minute we said it they're like oh duh, oh yeah 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 of course yeah yeah you, we were going to do that not until we did these maps were they going to do it, because it really showed them that if you have this long-term partnerships with people, you can get places for your students to learn. They can go and do work placements, they can get training, they can meet the stars, go in and see the rehearsals. They can use those venues without having to pay for them if they want to have some West End experience. And then we did that on a micro scale too and said, you know, we really do encourage you to have a front door to the N7 district because, quite honestly, nobody knows you there. The local MP did not know that that was in their constituency. Uh, so we did the architecture thing too. We love playing with form and light and materials. You know, how do you make a beautiful new front door to a building on a £2.5 million budget? That's not much money to do very much at all, but we felt it was worth pursuing a new front door that would really welcome people in. But while we were at it, we threw in a public rail improvement just uh, down the road so that that's going to get thrown in for free. And we said, oh, TfL, can we have a zebra crossing? So that is now on their radar. They are really looking at putting a zebra crossing in right next to that. And if you don't draw it, it doesn't happen, as I think Simon Orford used to say, and many others. If you don't draw it, it won't happen. But what happens if you draw it, it kind of is more likely to happen, and quite often it does. So I really recommend you do that. Sorry, I'm in a very tutorial sort of mode. Uh, so we did some rejigging through the building and made a phased approach to replanning it, most of it concentrating on this welcome and ground floor. And guess what? We gave them a theatre. They were like, we can't afford a theatre. So there's not a debate. You are having a theatre. They've got a really simple theatre the size of this room with just some fold-out bleacher seating, and it works a treat. And now there are other organisations coming in and using it too, so it's become a local community resource. And the, the green pavilion on the road is called the N7 Studio, and it's where all their local contact with uh, local people takes place. Um, so it's a real welcome when you go there. You can walk in. It's become a public building. For the first time, it's actually got signs inside telling you where the loos are. Never had any of those kind of public, generous actions. Uh, it's very, very cheaply made with lots of plywood and exposed surfaces. Uh, old windows uh, rediscovered to allow this openness and transparency within. Uh, really simple fittings that feel like backstage creative spaces for, this is also doubles as a foyer to the theater. And then the theater itself, really, really simple. And look at that block work. We love a bit of concrete block work. That is the cheapest way, guys, that you can build. What its uh, carbon footprint is, I can't tell you, but it's a lot cheaper than using loads of steel and those Metzek and plasterboard. All that plasterboard has got one of the highest embodied um, carbon factors in it. So we've got rid of that. Anyway, people seem to like it, so please drop by. I'm going to whiz through. How am I doing? Yeah, very, very quick. We restored 
the Economist Plaza. How many of you know the Smithsons? Have you heard of the Smithsons, anybody? Oh, good, a few of you. Very important architects made this amazing building. Go to it in central London, just by St. James's Palace. Gorgeous photographs taken in uh, 1964 by a 23-year-old. And they became iconic um, of this amazing building. The architects situated themselves in it. it they wrote about it. And they were the absolute uh, consummate academics architect. They're known throughout the world. But they gave us some clues about how to restore it. They said that buildings have a life of their own. Um, so how do we reimagine a building like that when the whole of the world's kind of academic uh, uh, kind of class is looking at you and watching you misstep? Uh, you go back to the original source material. These images, when you see an image of a building, that is what the architect wants you, generally, to see. So we knew they had a point of view. Sorry, these are really low res for some reason. But this is what you were seeing on the ground when you got there. Really uninviting, but this important uh, bench and public space in the plaza still there. Everything very worn out and looking down at heel, and also a place with a lot of loitering. Very dated interiors. I'm going to whiz through, and really, really failing uh, office floors. What Really not a place, place, nice place to work. Very hot, very cold. Single glazing, no insulation. And round the back, the best bit, ooh, the loading bay. It's not actually a loading bay because you can't get a lorry in it. So they clutter up the street. They've got the bins out. It's a car park. Uh, and we said, that has got to change. That is disgusting. Um, and it had some steps put in in the 90s by SOM, who were based in the building. Um, and we were really lucky that we could find out what it was like back in 1960s, because, sorry, it's so fuzzy. It was part of a movie called Blow Up by Antonioni. So you can find this on, online. So it's really blurry. It doesn't look so bad when it's small. But this, this wonderful footage kind of showed how stark and impressive this architecture was. Yeah, I think I'll just go on to this. So we did our analysis that we applied to urban spaces. We looked where people move. So we said, how did people move in 1964? We didn't actually put that cart going all the way around, but this was general pedestrian movement. We then looked at, at the changes that had happened to sort of narrow that movement and make the place all seem a bit dead. And we said, in our future phases, we want to bring the life back into the square because that's what we found they'd written about. It was not meant to be all ghostly and empty. It was meant to be animated and, in fact, a tourist rendezvous, they said. We analysed the changes. Very simple method there. And then we did an analysis of how you view. We always look at how you view as you move through space. But here we said, let's look through the eyes of the architect back in 1964. Oh, they took a photograph here. Uh, they took a photograph there. What about if we put the top 10 or so photos together that come up when you search the, Smiths, the Economist Plaza? We put them on and look, they didn't take a photograph of that lovely loading area and they didn't take a bit of the loitering bit where that person was in this sort of northern courtyard. So clearly they knew they hadn't got it right because they didn't want to tell the world about it. And uh, so we looked at ways of improving it. We put in a little... Uh, long-term plan is to put a little staircase in here and to add some greenery here and to improve the lobby. And then we also looked at changing the existing plant room to pay for all of this with a two-storey addition that still looked like a plant room. So we developed a special fritted glass that looked like rather horrible fibrous cement. Uh, and the, everybody seemed pretty happy with that. And then uh, we inc increased, we took off some of these nasty additions. I don't know if you can see here, they're still here if you go to the site. I'll just run here. Um, H uh, SOM had like, added these sort of shop windows onto the street, which meant that you couldn't see up and down the street, which is a bit of a uh, false thing, to, a bit of a bad thing to do. And then we just said to our client, do you actually need a car park for 53 car cars? And they went, oh, yes. Oh, no, actually, we don't. Who needs a car park? So uh, in the future, there's going to be a gallery here and that new staircase. And what we did was we had to retrofit and pack all of that in BIM into that and get listed building consent. And we did this drawing, and it ended up in the Royal Academy in the summer exhibition. And then the year later, Chris Wilkinson did exactly the same for one of his buildings. So thank you, Chris. 
Uh, anyway, that is the technology and that is the challenge of being an architect, which I could talk to you about. That is what it really looks on site when you restore a modern masterpiece and you are putting in double glazing from the inside, taking off everything and putting insulation on the inside too, so that it's, uh, it's still only actually at EPCD. So we're going to have to see what we can do to up it. And then at the end of it, you get these amazing office spaces. Some men in particular go mad for really great office space. I mean, I like it. It's got a nice view, but it doesn't really float my boat <laughs> in terms of the ultimate aim. For me, it's about restoring a great building and getting an active public space back. But um, we did manage to make a very successful entrance where we used the original material from the outside on the inside, even inside on the back of the lift. That's very heavy stone. What you do is you peel off a piece of stone that's five mil thick and put it on a bit of, um, what's it called, that uh, crate, uh, what's it called, like bee, bees, what's it called, that sort of hack signal. Anyway, you put it on a lightweight substrate and it looks heavy, but it isn't. And um, now it's just a really lovely, clean, serene space like it used to be. And uh, people really love coming. Uh, lots of architects, whenever you go, uh, the, the space where I'm looking now has got chairs in it uh, and you can go and sit outside. And then we thought we'd do one too. So we took the design team back to the space and we thought we'd do an Alison and Peter Smithson. So we placed ourselves back in our project, uh, which is a bit of a spoof. Um, and then we had an opening and some of the old guys came. So I don't know if you've ever heard of Kenneth Frampton. Any of you heard of Kenneth Frampton? So Kenneth came and the photographer who's now 82, Michael Carapetian came, Ed Jones, uh, Julia Blomfield, anyway, loads of really amazing oldies came out of the woodwork and they're now my best mates, so, which is lovely. Um, and it's also, another thing we've managed to do is get the art reinstated on the square, which was part of the original vision. So by badgering the client, uh, they accepted this and now local uh, galleries use it, which is lovely. And it's even in wallpaper, which we thought was quite of entertaining that is used as a backdrop for fashion shoots if that floats your boat. Right, so final, you're in the home straight. Can you f manage five more minutes? Yeah, do you think? Oh, really quick. Anybody been to Broad Liverpool Street Station? Uh, if you go to the back of it, there's, uh, up there, there's a, a floating uh, public space uh, called Exchange Square next to a really lovely SOM building. Oh, there you are, I've zoomed in. And that's Exchange Square. Uh, we run, we uh, were asked to buy British Land, who owned this, what we did apart from building. Uh, we were asked to show our buildings. We said, we actually do lots of other things. And they said, oh, do you want to redesign Broadgate's public spaces? And we went, oh, no, not really, because we wouldn't be seen dead there. It's horrible. And they said, oh, please. Uh, and that's how we won it, because we, we, we're brutally honest. We also lose a lot of competition, so it's not a great business strategy. But um, this is what we found. They just spent millions with Arabs on resurfacing and reorganising the circle, and not many people using it. Apart from on Thursday and Friday night, back pre-pandemic, it became what was called the bear pit. And I know there's some girls in there, but it was a pretty aggressive area, you know, late at night. It was not nice. I didn't feel safe. Um, what we noticed, we, we came back to them with this idea of, uh, it has a series of public spaces which are great that they made public spaces back in the 80s and 90s, but they all had very different environmental conditions. So we talked about biomes and we said around the site, there's the circle, we think that's like a Mediterranean garden, etc. So we, we, did, we went with actually how it felt environmentally. So we also asked, when we got the commission, if we could have a copy of their CCTV, because we noticed there was this weird bunching going up outside the bars, and was that interfering with people's routes through? Um, and so we, we looked at lots of CCTV images and mapped the sort of congregational and movement spaces, and then the views, the, the light blue is where you're viewing as you're moving. So you've got that close proxemic, so people were huddled doing vertical drinking, and then you've got the rapid movement of people trying to get a train. That's me later tonight. I'm getting a train from Liverpool Street. So there you go. That's what it was like. And then what we did was we made chaos, sort of disruption, a bit Rem Cool House. You know, if you kind of mix things up, congestion is why New York City works. And basically what you needed here was a bit of congestion and greenery and cooling because makes building makes this space 
five degrees hotter here than anywhere else in Broadgate because it's a mirror. It just blasts the sun back into the space. And these are very carefully ergonomically designed so that you can feel comfortable on your own or with a group. It's got loose furniture and they're all redeployable and you can reuse them. So it's, that was for 250 grand. They thought that was good, really worthwhile. Then they gave us the job of the base of SOM's less successful, shall we say, I would never go to a place like this, as, as I said, uh, Broadgate Tower. Uh, and we made it into a bamboo forest, uh, which was just wonderful. And then we looked at what we called the Baltic, the Baltic kind of Scandinavian Nordic wastelands of Finsbury Avenue Square because it was so cold and really un in, in, inhospitable. And then they were refurbishing the lovely building behind, which is beautiful, grade two listed office block. And we said, why don't you put some activity along the hoarding? We were asked to design the hoarding. So we made it an inhabited hoarding, which they now do everywhere. Um, so that the shops were in there and people started using the space. And this is not pose, this is people genuinely, this shows how people spread out and use space and feel safe in their different areas. And then we found out all these other people were using it. We didn't expect, it was brilliant. So you go back and do post-occupancy evaluation and you find out people are doing sort of parkour and having late night girls pizza evenings. Ka-ching, brilliant, love it. Uh, also, this is what was tagged drunk yoga in the Broadgate Plaza. <laughs> And there's some slightly more serene uh, Tai Chi going on over there. And then we found people using it for fashion shoots and these bleeding exercising guys, six o'clock in the morning, it's packed. So the city is doing things while you're asleep and it never ceases to surprise you. But then that was another 250 grand or something, half a million that one. And then they said, yep, you've, you've earned your stripes, DSDHA. Here is 15 million pounds to change that beauty. So this is the public space welcoming you as you came up from Liverpool Street Station. Do you see the way that big red wall sort of just gently pushes you away from the public space and carefully screens the green space so you don't use it? But don't worry, you're on a commuter route with lots of steps on the left of the image and you're not really interested in green space, are you? You're in a hurry, you've got to get to work. It's very contradictory. And then stranded over here, this beautiful sculpture, uh, yeah, all in all, not a place that was very nice. This is, you've come past that big curving wall and here you get the green sort of carpet. Uh, you've got a retail unit, a shop and bar, stopping you looking into the grade two listed, uh, what is that called, the um, train sheds of Liverpool Street. The trains are underneath you the whole time. You don't know that. And then on your left, you have lovely exchange house um, and stranded Venus. And then there's the water feature in front of Venus. Now this, I find it particularly inviting the way that those jagged rocks really make me feel at ease, don't you? And sort of relaxed. And, and I love the juxtaposition with those curving bronze anyway. And you, of course, not being able to see the, what a relief we don't have to look at that bloody train shed. It's something to be embarrassed by, isn't it? Yeah, so this is up. I'm now standing above that water feature. Look at that structure. That is really heavy, beautiful stone used for, I'm not sure what purpose, anyway. Uh, yeah, so we said we like to get rid of it all. It's just terrible. There are a few, we, we have to scrape the barrel looking for the good points, like, oh yes, you can see through to the plaza. But yeah, it's so inaccessible, blah, blah, blah. Did our movement and view, looked at where people will use work, walking now, where they might prefer to walk in the future. Uh, and then we said, but how do you make a landscape over a railway station? Well, you look at the railway station, don't you? Every railway station connects you to a different bit of Britain. And every bit of Britain is unique and has its own ecosystem and geology. And so we always, always, always look at the geology under a site. Again, people think we're wasting time because the geology is what shapes the environment and those biomes, you know, what is underneath it? Well, if we go to Norfolk, which I, I'm doing this evening, Quite often it's misty, languid, estuarine landscapes, like the beautiful brackish water at Tolsbury here. So you start sketching. These are genuine sketches that I did, just so you know. They're not posted. A lot of architects do the sketches after. Like, oh, I was just, <laughs> these are genuinely my sketches. Uh, this is a nice post-rationalization. So everybody's rushing into Liverpool Street, where well, this is pre-pandemic, uh, all coming from across the whole of East Anglia, 
what about if we just take a line, a kind of languid line, and slow down the landscape here, and let nature just gather around that line, the water line, let the movement happen, level, level access everywhere, put facilities around the, and water around the water line, and lots, four times as much greenery. We've got 14, what's it? Oh no, we've got uh, 14,000 plants and 140 species. There you go, lots of 14s and four times as much greenery. So this was the drawing, a bit cheesy because it's a CGI, but looking at how we made a 200 meter landscape ripple through a quite constrained space and dealt with the levels by making it all level access, gently ro ramping up. It's a slope, so we don't need uh, level changes. It ramps technically, bringing all the way around so you can touch Venus at the top. And you need to replace that retail unit, and it's very heavy. That's where the water tanks were, because this whole raft underneath it was built by Arabs using not the same concrete thickness everywhere, but different thicknesses. So this is us stripping off all of that stone, which is now held over in British lands, Canada water. And then that's us using void former to bring all of the level up. We've got to find a sustainable alternative to void former that's light, but we can't at the moment. Maybe honeycomb of some sort. Anyway, and then this is us building this new landscape that allows you to come up and around. That took 18 months and it was done through through uh, COVID. So you now have various character areas. If you're ever doing landscape, you need to have lots of variety so that the diversity of people can find what they're looking for. We love railway lines. How do you link railways with languid landscapes? You make a curve from the components that make railways. You build one-to-ones in your studio garden and have a drink on them and test whether they actually work or not. You work with Italian terrazzo companies to make a bespoke terrazzo that embodies the kind of tonality of those East Anglian sort of landscapes you're looking for. You test whether your idea of a really tiny water feature that uses only 10% of the energy of the other one, that only has water one inch deep but looks amazing, can actually work, and that did. And then you build it and they will come. So do go and have a look. This is in December people started turning up. There, were, there is no signage to show you that this is here at the moment. They are just waiting to see if people will find it. They do, and everybody loves the railway station, completely besotted by it. People still are commuting through it. Train spotters came, whoop, whoop. I was so pleased at that, really. I thought it was all gonna be selfies, you know, like this, but it wasn't. Uh, and then, ooh, what's this one? Uh, yeah, and this is the view up to them. You can see the park from the platform. We have, you know when you say a oh, bit of biodiversity? We've got ducks. Didn't think they were going to come. We've got kids. We sort of knew they might come. Uh, but we didn't realise it would go mad on, you know what, and Babs Lands, what London would be peddling. It's the top, one of the top ten baby spaces. And then you have adults discovering that they like play, which is for me, is a real testament of success. You've got roller, roller skates, etc. We've got a gardener. We said we'd like a gardener. They have them at the High Line in, in New York, and our client has got us gardeners. So this is lovely Jamie, very Shoreditch. He's like a barista gardener, isn't he? <laughs> and then we've got kids. Uh, Jamie plays, plays. He, he, he displays and explains how gardens work to local school kids. And these are the kids who came during, before we were, were on site, you can see some of the team, uh, and told us what they wanted from it. And then really nice, uh, British Land have uh, opened it up to, this is the first public gathering we had. Uh, it's over 100 people coming for iftar uh, during Ramadan, uh, local community to sort of welcome them in to use it, which is just wonderful. Uh, and it is really very popular. I whizzed through the last pictures. Uh, it gets very, very busy. And what's lovely is it celebrates SOM's gorgeous building. And you don't have to go up steps anymore. It's all level. People just seem to be very relaxed. Uh, you can sit in the shade if you don't want that heat. You can touch Venus now uh, and then really nice. If you go between eight and nine, you get rewarded with a bit of East Anglian mist, uh, which is 
very, very nice. Um, that's because one of the owners of the site said they wanted a wow. And so we said, we don't do wows, we do subtle. So we did something subtle. Yeah, so it's, it's a place to be with people or on your own. And then this is DSDHA uh, there in the evening. And that's where I'm going tonight. So thank you. Only if people could bear it, because you've been through about an hour, haven't you? Yeah, I've done an hour. Sorry, guys. Seven. Oh. No questions, are there? Any, anybody? You can come up afterwards if you've got a question. Does that make any sense? Hmm? I live in, I live in no. Oh, is that for a wife? 